This conference will now be recorded. So, uh, today, Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022. Uh, we can begin our city council work session for this evening. Uh, this evening's presentation will be on community and economic development. And Mr. Jeff Swanson will be presenting to the council. Uh, I do see we have some guests on this evening. Uh, so uh, work sessions are for council members to have a dialogue amongst themselves and to ask the presenter any questions that they may have, but there won't be any opportunity for public comment during a city council work session. So I just wanna remind everybody of that. Um, and Jeff, if you could please do the roll call. Sure. Uh, let's see, Council Member Fox. I'm here. Council Member Strobin. Present. Council Member Boyle. Present. Council Member Serveny. Present. Council Member Casperg. Absent. He is on his way. I just I texted him before the meeting there. He said he's coming. So he will be here, Jeff. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mayor Thornton. Present. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we can go ahead and get started. Jeff, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to you. I know you have a PowerPoint presentation and I would encourage council members to ask any questions they have as we go through the presentation. All right, well, just a second here, because I, whenever I share my screen, it messes everything up. And I like to see the Hollywood squares. <laughs> so, there we go. Okay. Well, Council, uh, I want to provide a brief overview of the community and economic development function at the City of La Center and how economic development works in La Center and a little bit about my role in that. The functional area is overseen by Public Works Director Brian Cast and City Engineer Tony Cooper. City also Tony also serves as the Deputy Director of Public Works. Uh, Jessica Nash is the City's Permit Technician, and Alexander Richter, who is uh, new to the City, provides customer service. Jim Perry is our Building Official. The City is supported by two consulting firms. WSP and Exigy. Ethan Spoo from WSP serves as the city's planner and leads city related work where other WSP team members are involved. So sometimes it's not just Ethan, they have a wetlands biologist, they have uh, lots of other staff that uh, Ethan leads in uh, development review uh, and through that process. I lead XG's work on behalf of the city, which includes planning oversight and uh, some governmental affairs and kind of a grab bag of lots of other things. Bronson Potter is the city attorney and he provides support on specific projects and issues as required. Some of uh, the work that we do in development um, requires uh, intensive legal review. And so uh, Bronson does that for us. The group works as a cohesive team, scaling up where needed to respond to the volume of work the city needs to process at any given time. The city also relies periodically on an outside engineering firm and a firm that provides plan review and building inspection services. So on occasion, uh, our workload of inspections and plan review um, and some of our engineering work exceeds what the staff are able to do. And we have strict timelines in which we need to turn around an application and get notes and comments back to an applicant. And so we rely on some outside firms to assist us in keeping up with the workload. And I'm just gonna note for the record that Council Member Casper has arrived. We'll go on to the next. Technical issues. Oh, no worries. No worries. It happens. 
Excuse me, Jeff. I just want to remind everyone if they would please mute their microphones. We're getting a little bit of a playback, so but it could mute their microphones unless they have a question. Thank you. All right. So examples of specific this division of responsibilities is on this slide. Brian Cass, he provides departmental oversight. That's for all of public works, uh, streets, parks, um, the wastewater treatment plant. He oversees development engineering, capital program management. Uh, Tony Cooper uh, gives oversight to the area of community and economic development. He does the development engineering and he does capital project manage management for the city. Jessica Nash, she provides customer service, coordinates activities with the building and planning functions and supports the planning commission staff. Uh, she's, so for their monthly meetings, she serves as the, uh, the clerk for those uh, meetings and prepares the agendas and, and so on. Uh, Alexander Richter, he provides customer service and administrative support and works on the uh, public information function. So we have a web page you can go to that shows uh, all of the uh, applications under review by the city. It's on the city's uh, community development page. There's history there. We rely on that information being up to date so that applicants and community and others can see uh, what it is it's come in that we're reviewing, working on. Uh, Jim Perry is responsible predominantly for inspection and code interpretation. He does some plans examination and uh, he manages the overflow work. So when there's uh, work that goes out to other firms for plan review or building inspection, he supervises their work and he also provides customer service. Uh, Ethan Spoo is our planner. Uh, he works with uh, customers who call with specific land use questions, gives some uh, technical uh, advice on the front end and uh, answers questions and of course guides development review through uh, different processes. So like subdivision, site plan review and, and that sort of thing. Um, he's also responsible for our comprehensive plan and does our code updates related to building and development. And he also staffs the planning commission. Uh, I, in this area of work that I do for the city, I do economic development. I provide customer service. I work on the strategy, the capitalization and project management. And I provide uh, planning oversight and support. Bronson Potter provides a legal review. He uh, is responsible for interpreting municipal code and tells us what the uh, site boards are on uh, the parameters around where we have discretion, where we do not in terms of uh, accommodating specific applicant requests. And uh, he manages the municipal legislative process. So when something is for example, like a code text amendment or a comp plan amendment, don't change. Um, Bronson would be the one who would prepare those uh, ordinances to go to the city council. And uh, if there are any that need to go to planning commission first, then he provides a review of those as well. The community and economic development functional area has three primary strategies and objectives. One is to improve the efficiency of our day-to-day -day operations. We do uh, consistent process review and improvement. We meet weekly to talk about uh, different applications or inquiries and where those are in the status uh, and uh, what needs to be done to those. Uh, a few years ago, we contracted with McKay Spazito to come in and do an analysis of the department. That resulted in some restructuring of functions, different division of labor within the department, uh, as well as some uh, recommendations for how to improve our processes, how to institute better internal controls, better transparency, better adherence to our uh, code and our policies. 
and we've been uh, implementing those recommendations uh, over the course of the last few years. Um, the department's also responsible for the long-term development of the community. This is primarily memorialized in a 20-year comprehensive plan. Now, we'll soon be going through a comp plan update. And so uh, under the Growth Management Act, the city is responsible for providing sufficient land to meet the uh, projected residential growth over the 20 year period, as well as sufficient land for the projected employment growth. So that's residential land and commercial industrial land. And so we'll be having discussions here over the next uh, probably year, year and a half over uh, potential urban growth boundary expansions and uh, what would be involved in, uh, in that process. Um, we also run uh, funding strategy, capital facilities plan. So impact fees, uh, looking for grants and earmarks so that our transportation system and our utilities uh, are keeping up with the growth. Uh, comp plan review and adjustment. So when there are um, areas in the comp plan that uh, don't work, and uh, areas of conflict in the code. Um, part of what our department does is we uh, work those through the process to, uh, to fix them. So uh, example of that would be um, looking at uh, minimum lot sizes versus density transfer. There's a, actually a, was, has, has been an area of conflict in the past where some jurisdictions allow for what's called a one-to-one -one density transfer on a piece of property that's encumbered by uh, environmental constraints. Um, ours has a parameter of a minimum lot size, and so that can be um, detrimental to some economic development projects. Uh, code revisions and alignment with the comp plan. Um, occasionally we have uh, code that is in conflict with the comp plan and so uh, a lot of code cleanup uh, has been what's been going on over the last few years. On uh, economic development, um, we prim primarily look at driving the development readiness of land. This really relates to what the city does. Um, you know, the city uh, doesn't go out and tracked neighborhoods or tracked businesses. Uh, there are organizations that do that on our behalf. It's our job primarily to make sure that our land use and our infrastructure is in a place where we have development ready land and um, opportunities for that growth to occur within the jurisdiction. We try to foster an, ex an environment that attracts private investment. So having simple, efficient, entitlement processes, having responsive service, and uh, receiving communication and market feedback uh, through the development review process helps us understand where we need to, uh, to make tweaks. So I want to demonstrate in concept how economic development works. And so if we look at the center junction, we'll take that as an example. And uh, you can see an aerial of the junction area on the right and on the left is the junction plan, which was adopted in, I believe, 2017 or 2018 and is what's called a, a uh, form-based code rather than a Euclidean type of zoning code. And when we say Euclidean, what we mean is that the uses correspond to the lot lines. So on one parcel, you would have one use, like residential or commercial or industrial. Uh, in a form-based code, you can have multiple uses within a single parcel. And so that's what the junction plan uh, exemplifies. And so you can see that there are four different types of uses up at the junction. Some residential 
mixed town general uh, sorry about that town center and town employment i have a small bear playing in the background here so apologize for the crash noises so that's really the the difference between um, a euclidean type of zoning and a form-based code Form-based codes usually emerge from what's called a master planning process. Uh, Vancouver Waterfront is an example. Uh, the uh, Heights area of Vancouver is another master planned area. Um, it's Washougal, uh, their town center has gone through a master planning process. And so you find a variety of uses where there's uh, more intense, intensified use uh, say like in a town center style, which is what you see on this plan. And then as you spread away from the town center areas, there's uh, more residential and uh, on the south end is where the industrial is. So over time, this uh, private land was brought under the city's jurisdiction through urban growth boundary expansions and annexation. Uh, changes from the former rural zoning designations to urban designations were made at the time of those land use actions and were later adjusted through the sub area planning and comp plan changes that I mentioned. Uh, the challenge following these actions and persisting today really relates to the development costs to render these properties pad ready. And the term pad ready means that the civil improvements necessary or final site development are in place. And this includes infrastructure like offsite utility connections and transportation system improvements. Uh, in this area, there's been a lot of progress in the urbanization of the infrastructure and the capacity. There, a new freeway interchange has been constructed. Uh, Paradise Park Road has been realigned and a sanitary sewer force main has been constructed in La Senna Road, connecting the junction to the wastewater treatment plant. These are all very heavy lifts in terms of capital. Uh, but there are gaps that remain, and these gaps affect the market viability of site development. These gaps include lift stations and sewer lateral connections to the force main, construction of local streets, and costs such as impact fees, system development charges, and the charges related to the sewer latecomer agreement. These costs are borne by the private property owners and developers and occur early in site development, long before a site can host an occupant and generate a return for the developer. Um, there's some additional complexity uh, that relates to private sector property market transactions and their timing and the subsequent construction activity. Uh, for transaction to occur, a buyer and a seller must agree on the approximate value and be willing to transact. And that's not always uh, predictable. Um, oftentimes a developer has an idea of what the market value of a piece of property is and the landowner uh, has a much different uh, idea of what the value of that is. And so um, in order for something to happen, uh, they need to come to some kind of agreement. Um, before a, a development, a proposal has to be vetted through the jurisdiction's entitlement process. So this requires the applicant to commit to planning, engineering, jurisdictional review, and other costs to obtain development approval. Uh, and finally, developers uh, typically time their construction activities towards favorable market conditions for labor and materials, uh, particularly given the going selling price or lease rate per square foot. So all these things, cost of the dirt, cost of labor and materials, the time it takes to transact, to construct all the civil improvements, and then finally get pads and either sell the pads or construct buildings on the pads and get them sold or leased up. It's a pretty long cycle time uh, before a developer generates cash. So it's a pretty significant investment of both time, risk, and of course, finances. So um, as we think about, you know, what can the city do? 
in this. City can influence that development environment. And this is done through reducing possible infrastructure burdens by pursuing state and federal grants and under other funding appropriations. And this can help pay for road improvements and sewer lines where otherwise the uh, developer would be burdened with a significant public, the significant development expense of those pieces of infrastructure. Um, the city can work consistently to improve its responsiveness and customer service, uh, responding with uh, timely and helpful context and information to inquiries from property owners and prospective developers. City can periodically review zoning designations to assure consistency with market opportunity. The city can make its entitlement process as straightforward, brief, and certain as possible. A lot of that is accomplished through providing good customer service, helping projects and applicants get to a yes by offering information and expertise. And finally, the city can work with its regional economic development partners, the Columbia River Economic Development Council, Identity Clark County, the Port of Ridgefield, the Washington State Department of Commerce, the Metro Regional Government, Greater Portland Inc., and so forth. We compete as a region to land uh, economic opportunity. Uh, the city has been making consistent efforts and improvements in each of these areas and expects to continue to do so. It typically takes a lot of years for property to convert from undeveloped rural land to urbanized occupied property for all the reasons that I just mentioned. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have and would certainly welcome the opportunity to meet uh, individually with council members and members of the community who might have questions about economic development issues. So any questions that I can uh, field? Hey Jeff, I was just curious, when was the last 20-year um, plan done or updated? It was adopted in uh, 2016. And uh, as part of that comp plan update, the city of La Center, uh, I wasn't there at the time. I was actually at the county. And then I think by the time we adopted the plan, I was at uh, Battleground. But uh, I believe in that process, the uh, city of La Center brought a pretty significant amount of land into its urban growth area uh, and then subsequently annexed it, kind of in a hurry. And, uh, that was a uh, subject of, uh, of some litigation that uh, didn't actually settle out until I, I want to say like 2020. So yeah, oftentimes, Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, oftentimes in the county, um, I, I can't think of a comp plan and Bronson's on and maybe, maybe he can comment on this, but I can't think of a comp plan update uh, that's been done where there wasn't some kind of issue litigated with um, Future Wise or uh, Friends of Clark County or some other conservation interests. Well, I, I wouldn't say that there's none, Jeff, but it's pretty common. And I think the litigation on the expansion of the La Center urban growth area went into 2021, but uh, is finally concluded. And uh, so that's behind us now. Yeah, so when you update a comp plan, you bring land into your UGA, um, you can sometimes be subject to, you know, litigation process for three to five years after that. Other questions? Jeff, would there be any benefit of um, considering a possible open house with um, CREDC and area developers to just discuss um, the center's long range plans and hopes and dreams and kind of get a sense of, you know, establish the dialogue? I know you've already met with many of them, but I was just wondering if we actually made it a more of a 
formal process and invited them out. Um, if that was, if you'd seen that make any positive um, steps with any other communities or what your thoughts are. Yeah, usually that's done uh, kind of in context of the comprehensive plan update. So usually, you know, the city has uh, goals that are um, enumerated in the comprehensive plan. And so that's usually a good time, like kind of on the outset of an update to ask the community to come in and conduct some kind of process to solicit feedback on the current plan and the plan's goals. And uh, ask people to weigh in on what they would like to see changed or uh, new or different or you know, stay the same as we look at the next 20 year plan. Okay. What is uh, some of the interest of businesses that are trying to get into La Center? If there is any right now residential development is really hot so uh, most of the transactions that we're seeing contemplated relate to either single family or multi-family development but how does that help with increasing our revenue as much as we need to in addition to jobs uh, well it generates property tax it generates uh, one-time construction-related sales tax. Um, so it does generate revenue, but um, the commercial market is pretty chilly right now. That's your final answer? That's it? Uh, are you looking for something else? Well, I mean, you're saying that there's been zero interest in any businesses moving up at the I-5 or moving anywhere at all. There's no business licenses coming in, no businesses trying to move in, only residential. That's the only thing new right now. Well, I'm, the, I'm talking about the land development side. So somebody looking to acquire a parcel and develop a parcel. There's Hi, been I little to no interest in commercial or industrial. There's been some interest in uh, some warehousing and distribution uses up at the junction, but I would say those are sort of passing interests. So Jeff, do you have an opinion as to why that might be, why there isn't more interest from commercial type developers, industrial type developers for the Lysander Junction? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> for the uh, developers that I've talked with that have come in and looked at different properties, um, they've run into the, the same issues that I described. So um, the differential between their perception of the land value and the property owner's perception of the land value, um, the infrastructure costs, the, the roads that they would need to construct to serve the site, the uh, sewer improvements in particular. Um, the south side of La Center Road up at the junction is really challenging uh, depending on how you approach it um, in terms of sewer. So if someone's just going to acquire one parcel on the uh, south end uh, to get sewer there requires uh, a few pump stations and pump stations cost one and a half to two million dollars each and uh, so if someone were to come in and acquire all of that land and do kind of an area-wide approach uh, th there are some approaches where uh, you could probably configure a gravity line and it would negate the need for those pump stations. But it takes a lot of uh, cooperation with property owners and, uh, and the developers to make that happen.
I think the other issue is, you know, what we've figured out during the pandemic is, uh, and, and this trend was just exacerbated by the pandemic. Before the pandemic, Amazon was kind of taking over the world. And so a lot of commercial retail spaces, uh, the value of those uh, dropped pretty substantially. And industrial is uh, a challenge all its own. So Jeff, knowing that that's a challenge in, in industrial and commercial at this point in time, um, how are we pursuing the tribe and the sewer system that's been brought up a few times over the last year and the connection? Uh, is that moving forward? Is there progress being made? Because each time I've asked about it, it's been a very, very brief answer. I'd like to get a little bit more in depth in it and find out how we can make that work together. Well, I can say that we've had discussions with them and have proposed and, you know, when they were planning the hotel, we proposed working out something where they could connect to the sewer system. Um, they are confident that their existing plant has the capacity to serve both the casino and the hotel. And so they did not want to pursue that. The, there is an inner tie, and so it would be really easy to serve that entire reservation uh, because the infrastructure is already in place. Basically, out in front of their convenience store, you just turn one valve off and turn another one on, and all of their flow would come to our wastewater treatment plant. Um, we do take their solids, so their liquids go to their plant, but their solids are um, shipped by truck to our plant uh, to run through our process. But they do not have an interest at this time in the, the liquids to us. Interesting, because that, that's not what my um, interpretation has been of our conversations uh, in the past for the past six or seven months. I thought this was something that was viable that we were looking into. All right. Thank you. Other questions, Council? Well, I'd just like to throw out that I don't drive north too often, but I did today and i was very surprised along i-5 how much growth um has occurred between you know the the uh Cowlitz county area and the and the thurston county area south of olympia um huge warehouse buildings and trucking distribution centers have been have been built up there so, um, you know, I know some of the challenges that that people are facing right now are the supply chain issues and labor market issues, but there's still companies out there finding a way around it. Um, I would I would certainly hope that there's some options out there where we can start putting that um, sewer infrastructure in. I, I don't think we have the some of the stuff I saw today, I don't think we have the the massive land there to fulfill some of those companies' needs, but I would certainly think that there's enough room for for some smaller warehousings and things. So um, is is that on the list or are we keeping an eye out for that or potentially even reapproaching the tribe to solve some of those um, infrastructure issues? specifically the sewer that that uh, might be hindering our interest in that area? Yeah, really the the sewer issue, so there's one parcel up here, the one with the purple buildings on it is the one that's really suitable for um, warehousing distribution. And that's the one where you would have to put in several lift stations to get through the topography back up to the force main. The force main is in La Center Road. And uh, so that's where the expense is. Um, we did have uh, an inquiry about, uh, this would be several months ago, someone was looking at wanting to put a warehousing distribution operation on the FUD property, which now is owned by the tribe. Um, I think what they were looking at was like 100,000 square foot warehousing distribution facility, but it's not consistent with the plan designation. So it would require uh, a change 
in use of those parcels in order to make the, the use conform with what our plan is. The junction plan also, uh, you know, I, I wasn't around when it was devised, but my understanding is what the community wanted in that process was they wanted, they did not want big box and they didn't want warehousing and distribution. Uh, one of the issues with warehousing distribution is it is a pretty low job density. It's roughly four jobs per acre where other light industrial uses range anywhere from nine to 18 jobs per acre. And so what the planning commission and uh, city council at the time indicated was that they wanted to see higher job densities on the employment parcel. What's described in that plan, those purple buildings is more like a business park. So there's no one single massive warehouse. It's a, a series of smaller um, business park type of buildings where light industrial would be a permitted use. So yeah, that's correct, Jeff. I mean, when the city, both the planning commission and the city council contemplated the sub area plan for the junction, the city did go through a very in-depth um, detailed study for that area. Uh, we had many public meetings, uh, property owners were involved, business owners were involved. And that plan really was developed over a period of time. Uh, with our city planner, we had a contract architect that also worked with us on this project, along with some other engineering firms. So that plan developed over time. And um, so that is a planning commission, well, Center Planning Commission spent a great deal of time working on that project. So that is something that evolved uh, over you know, a couple of years. Um, also, the you touched on a little bit earlier about the um, land to jobs ratio as well. And one of the reasons that the city was successful in getting their last urban growth area expansion, um, it was 52 acres of land that was um, included in our urban growth area at our last expansion, uh, was specific purpose of having more land available for jobs. And of course that ties back into our comp plan. And those are some requirements that we have to look at. And warehousing really does not fulfill those requirements. Um, so it's again, the plan, you know, tried to check as many boxes as it could when we were going through the, the plan process. Um, we're talking a lot about the junction. Jeff, could you just uh, touch on briefly uh, the planned action area for the downtown core area and what the city has uh, allocated in terms of funds for that plan as well. Um, yes. So um, talk a little bit about what a planned action area is. So what you see here is a sub area plan for the junction. Um, a planned action area would take that a step further and um, conduct the environmental work. Uh, generate an environmental impact statement. And uh, what that does is that relieves the burden of doing project level environmental work provided what somebody proposes is in the parameters of the plan, uh, but they it moves the project through the development process a lot quicker. So the concept is to do both a sub area plan and a planned action area for the historic town center of Lister and would include the Tin and Landing area. Um, so that would again involve a sub area planning process and then uh, generating an environmental impact statement. I, um, I have a cost for that. Would be interrupt for just a second. 500000 Okay. Um, I don't want to discount the work that the Planning Commission or, or the previous council has done, especially with this work at the uh, at the junction. Um, I, I think it was very relevant at the time, but 
we've gone through a couple of years that we have we have never faced issues with before. So um, my question is, do we need to relook at this and see if that plan needs to be amended? Um, I mean, really, four jobs per acre is four more than what is on a lot of those pieces of property right now. Um, not to mention the the revenue that would come in during the the construction phases so just as a thought uh, what are your opinions on whether or not this should be looked at again and it might be appropriate for that downtown corridor area too yeah so um, I, I think it would be a good idea to review the plan and validate either that it works or it doesn't uh, and do that with some input from the development community um, the thing you have to balance that with is you have to remember that cities are in the forever business. And so if something develops there now, it's probably going to be there for 30 to 50 years. And so that's two generations before it'll redevelop into something else. That's a typical timeline for something to redevelop. And so you really have to think uh, carefully and solicit a lot of community input about, you know, what do we think we want to see there over the next 50 years? And if we are just trying to, you know, grab a development opportunity, um, it starts to look at development at any cost, you know, just trying to get in there. You really want to make sure you have a, a vision that that aligns with. Because it, does affect well, the Some of the other aspects I think we have to take to heart are the types of um, business and on the flip side, the overall expenses that those are going to drive in terms of maintenance of the roadways and what the city would be looking at as far as total expenditures over time and the plus and minuses on both sides of any kind of development and how we can best um, kind of guide that going forward like you said jeff for the long term um the forever aspect you know how how can we balance all of those those pieces of it wisely it's quite the jigsaw puzzle that's for sure but I also think we're getting out of a pandemic and it's a new time. And I think warehousing space is one of the top, you know, looked after thing right now because so many people are selling stuff online and they need space. So I think we're kind of limiting ourselves by just saying, oh, we're forever. Well, we'd also like a police force. We'd also like a lot of things. And if we don't change anything, we're going to be stagnant and right where we are 10 years from now. So. That's my two cents. I don't think anybody is saying we can't look at it or, you know, reevaluate anything. I think all I'm saying is just when we look at it, look at both sides of the fence so that we know our decisions are going to be sound. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at the at what's envisioned there on the junction plan, uh, the elements, so compact development, uh, street facing buildings, parking on the interior, um, parks and open space, walkable, uh, you know, so you have to decide over the next 50 years, do you want to drive by something like that, provided it can develop, or do you want to drive by, a, you know, Dollar Tree Warehouse every day on your way to and from your home in the center? I'd like to drive past a police officer that's in his car. That's what I'd like. You know, I want to go back to addressing that sub area plan that you guys were also talking about a few minutes ago. Um, where are we at with that? Because that was something that was approved in 2019 for 2020 budget. Has that made any progress at all? Uh, we have not put that out for bid. So, uh, yeah, it, we, the, the next step really is to finalize uh, an RFQ or RFP and get it out to bid. What's the delay in that, Jeff? 
Uh, you know, one of the ways, Council Member Strobel, you might recall that during the pandemic that the City Council opted to defer some of those projects into a future date. So that was one of the issues that delayed it. Um, and quite honestly, another issue is just the workload that the city staff has at this time. I mean, it's, it is scheduled to be um, a process this year. Um, it's just contingent upon what the staff's work schedule is. And uh, it's definitely something that it's a high priority for the city. Hope to get it done as soon as possible. I have a quick question. Um, as far as the consultants, uh, Jeff and uh, Ethan, how many hours a week do you work for the city? Are you full time? Are you 40 hours? Are you just salary and you work, you know, yourself to a bone like you're self employed? Like what's what's your level of input? Uh, well, I think for both Ethan and myself, we both put in the hours that are necessary to get the work done that's assigned to us. And so on average, I would say it's 20 hours a week. Some weeks it's 50 hours. It just depends on what's going on. There's no steady flow. There's a season, a construction season. There's a season where people are looking to go through the land use entitlement process and they kind of all come through at once. Okay, well that just kind of can threw me for a loop and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if we're so backed up with work um, that we can't get the sub area plan going, how are we paying you to work 20 hours a week when we could be getting the full 40 out and getting this, you know, this stuff started going forward? My thoughts exactly. Well, it's not just Jeff's time, it's all city staff. I mean, city engineer, uh, as you know, we're just going through the process right now, bringing on a new public works director. I mean, it's not just the st staff time of Jeff. Jeff has been consumed with a lot of projects. I mean, you know, the thing is, we're talking about commercial development right now, but the city has had many, many um, residential developments brought forward. Some of them have been rather challenging, consumed a lot of Jeff's time and Ethan Spoo's time. I don't want to discount the challenges that we've experienced with some of those projects. Um, so as far as the actual hours that uh, WSP is working and, and Jeff is working, it really does fluctuate quite a bit month to month. However, over time, it's the city is, does its best to balance um, the workload with the available the availability of our overall staff. So um, again, it's quite amazing how things can get amped up. Everybody's busy and then it slows down. And that's one of the challenges that the center has. Um, you know, we're such a small jurisdiction and things fluctuate so much over time and through a budget cycle, it's really challenging for the city to accommodate the ebbs and the flows. Um, at least that's been my experience since I've been the mayor. Uh, and you know, I can go back to when I started being the mayor back in 2016. And I think Liz can verify back in 2015 and 14 before we had the current consultants that we have on staff. I mean, we were processing somewhere in the neighborhood of you know 10 to 15 building permits a year. Uh, now we're doing over 100 building permits a year just for new residential homes. Uh, as everybody knows, we've had a middle school uh, that was constructed over the past couple of years, which in itself brought many challenges to the city staff. Um, you know, we do have commercial de development that's moving forward at the junction. I don't want to lose sight of that as well. I mean, we do have minute management and their project uh, continues to move forward with their hotel, uh, convenience store, uh, retail space, and, and fast food restaurant. So. Um, yeah, it's not like the city isn't being as um, responsive as possible when we do get these opportunities. It's just that it, it, it seems to fluctuate a lot over time. Okay, well, that, that's, that's great. That uh, kind of puts a spin on things, but at this point in time, I think before we, we need to cancel that conversation and move on because that's stuff that probably should be brought up in the contracts, but Thank you for the honesty. I, I do appreciate it. Okay. You know, I did have one question. Um, 
you know, how, what can we do to bring our focus back to, uh, you know, developing the infrastructure to get those pump and lift stations out to the junction where they're needed so that we can get these, you know, at least get the looks by these businesses or maybe more of them, you know, if the infrastructure is already in place. Yeah, so um, we've kicked around a couple of approaches with some property owners, and uh, one of them is called an integrated planning grant. It's uh, some funds that are available through the State Department of Ecology. Um, there needs to be some kind of um, you know, site cleanup sort of nexus to it. Um, but basically, it would allow us to do some feasibility studies on the land at the junction in terms of the uh, potential environmental issues. That areas had a lot of activity um, when it was under the county jurisdiction for many, many years, uh, including agriculture at an industrial scale. So, um, but basically, you can use the grant to do that and accomplish some of your goals. And one of those other goals would be getting some engineered costs for the streets and sewer laterals uh, that we can then go and pursue grants for. And do we have a process in place to uh, get the ball rolling with that stuff, or is that already in action? Uh, we really have to get um, the cooperation with the property owners to make that happen. Is that something where we could uh, bring them in or have some sort of meeting where they could, you know, discuss their concerns or, you know, proposals that they might have for the city? We have been having conversations for years on that. Right on. Um, yeah, I guess maybe just uh, keep hammering at that and I don't know. Obviously, something's got to happen to be able to get things rolling so that we can, you know, just get that infrastructure. And I think that's the, it seems to me like that's the primary piece that's missing in this puzzle right now. I agree. Yeah, it's really the sewer lateral in the, the streets, the cost of streets in those areas. Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, though, but I mean, the way the Growth Management Act works, I mean, it's really development is paid for, um, infrastructure is paid for at the time of development by the developer. So it's not like the city can get too far ahead of that in terms of developing infrastructure. Um, and I think Jeff has touched on that, that challenge um, in the center is working with property owners and trying to get those um, and developers to try to get those um, infrastructure projects identified. No, and yeah. I wasn't negating that at all. I just was thinking that maybe we could, you know, if we need to develop some sort of focus group or something to be able to, you know, maybe put some new eyes on those challenges and not saying that you, those things aren't already happening, but um, just from what I'm taking in from all of this, it seems like that's where Kind of a direction we should probably be looking at moving yeah so for for years i've been meeting with uh, both the property owners and their representatives you know land use attorneys uh engineers and planners that they hire to work on their behalf and have discussed these different issues and you know, they've had uh opportunities come their way and um the developers have passed on acquiring the property you know Extensively for reasons of infrastructure, but there, you know, it's never just one reason up there. There's a, a complex web of issues that uh, an investor would need to look at. Um, the thing we have to remember is that we're the regulator, we're the jurisdiction. We don't own the property, the property owner owns it, and they decide whether they want to transact. And when they transact, with the developer, then the developer proposes something that's consistent with um, the zoning that applies to the land, uh, and that's and that's where we can help. Uh, but if we can, you know, what what we had in mind was getting this integrated planning grant, doing that work, and then pursuing 
grants, earmarks at the legislature or whatever we could um, through various programs. There's a, the U.S. Economic Development Administration has some grant programs and we could likely get some uh, federal support for that with the nexus of the uh, tribal reservation uh, on our city periphery. We, uh, you know, with their cooperation, we could leverage that as well in terms of their influence uh, to, to be very competitive in getting grants and earmarks at the federal level. At the state level, there are some existing programs um, that are not necessarily funded. Uh, the, you know, the opportunities aren't necessarily uh, of a magnitude that would overcome the challenges there, but, you know, every bit helps. If we can get a $300,000 grant uh, and work with a developer, you know, that would just be enough, take enough edge off where they would say they okay, they'll do it. Jeff, when is this integrated planning grant due? Uh, they're in an ongoing cycle. So every biennial budget, um, the state funds the program and you submit an application when you've got one to submit and uh, yeah is okay so how many have we submitted we haven't submitted any and we haven't submitted any again because it depends on the consent of the property owner Has, has any of the developers been approached with the possibility of, of cost sharing for any of that infrastructure? Um, I think that if we can attack some of the, some of the costs with those grants that you're discussing, they sound very probable. Um, I know in the past there wasn't necessarily identified developers on each of those lands and i'm asking for myself as much as i am throwing out a suggestion because i don't know what exactly has been done and, and what hasn't yeah well I, I think the dynamic to keep in mind is that uh, the developer wants to come in and wants to turn their investment into a return as quickly as possible and so you know if it's going to take um you know, a year and a half, two years to get environmental work done and get all of the infrastructure engineered and constructed before they can go vertical, then that's that's a long time to put out cash, pay interest on it, and not see a return. Most developers in the region are looking for sites that they can go vertical on within six to 12 months. So that's that's the issue we have. And that's why we have you know property owners who aren't developers still holding property. That makes sense. Thank you. Sounds mm -hmm. like they need a good salesman. Jeff, do you actually reach uh, out to these property owners and then uh, reach out to other business or developers to to actually talk and try to facilitate any type of development? Explain what you have in mind. Well, because if I remember correctly, you had uh, some investors or something that you'd mentioned in one of the planning commission meetings. Um, is that, you know, with your other, with your business, um, are you able to introduce them to property owners uh, to help facilitate sale and development of property without it being a conflict of interest or anything? So in, in the business that I do, um, generally speaking, I would say this is nearly all the time, if it's a development project, uh, they will come to me with a site already in mind and a concept for the site. So they're not looking for a location necessarily. They're looking, they have a site, they have a concept for it, and they're looking for someone to help them with the jurisdictional work. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, so the CRDC does 
that other type of stuff I was saying. So I wasn't sure if you were tied to stuff like that as well. Um, and are we leaning heavy on them to yeah. help us develop? Uh, but before you go on, since you mentioned the CREDC, uh, it's important to note that their role in this um, is, you know, they they can talk to somebody who's got the concept uh, and is looking for the site and help them find the site. They work with site selectors all the time. They're not a public agency. We are. And so a, a developer or an investor is not going to send to me at the city of La Center, hey, I want to do X, Y, and Z and compete with this guy and I'm going to invest all this cash because that's a public record. And so by working with the CREDC, they can shield their proprietary information, work with CREDC who works with the jurisdictions to find suitable sites. Does that clear make sense? Oh yeah, 100%. I, I've done uh, some IT work for them. So yeah, I'm pretty aware of what they do. Um, so another thing that we've spoke, I think at some of the retreats in the last couple of years, um, was some sort of assistance, you know, in the pump stations, uh, being able to help uh, push that along. So that's not such a hindrance in development up at the junction because of the um, unleveled ground. Is that still an option or have we pursued anything or even really kind of looked into it into any type of depth? Well, again, what we need is to go through like that integrated planning grant process that would fund the engineering work that would tell us where the sewer line would go, how much it would cost to put in, and then we take that information and go pursue a grant or an earmark. And how do we go about getting that looked at then? Do we have to go through a city, the city council meeting for that? But you still need the property owner's approval and interest in doing so, don't you, Jeff? Yes. It, it all starts with the property owner and the jurisdiction. If the property owner is willing to go down that path, then um, we can put in for the grant and uh, get the funds, do the work, and then that sets up phase two, which is go and get the money to construct. Would this, and is this also include the Griffith Farm? That's, they're sitting on their land, right? Is that my understanding? The Griffith Farm. Which property are you referring to? Uh, the property with the big red barn, right that's at the, the top. That's the, the first property, Jay. The what? Sorry, maybe I'm getting what? mixed up. That is the fudge property. Oh, okay. My apologies. And gonna... it was recently acquired by the Cowlitz tribe. Right, that. Okay. And then there and then there is is isn't there Griffith land up there? Or am I thinking something else? You look confused, so probably not. Okay. Somewhere else in the center. Other questions, Council? Okay, well, Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, Jeff, um, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, this is a challenging topic for sure, um, no doubt. One of the things that I've been thinking about here while we've been having this discussion and some of the comments that have been made by uh, some of the city council members is that you know, development for the sake of development is a is a good thing, um, and I do think. Uh, and Liz, maybe you have some ideas on this as well. But as a city council, and I've been on the council now for several years. You know what we attempt to do um, through work sessions and council meetings, what have you, is to really come up with a vision for what it is that we want to see in our community and how we want it developed out. And um, I don't remember of a time when the city council or the planning commission ever came to the conclusion that a bunch of warehouses and um, you know commercial type development at the junction. Uh, 
the conversations have all been always around the types of developments that we're hoping to ultimately achieve for our community. And again, I think that's probably something that we should try to tackle as a council again, uh, in terms of what a vision actually would be to incorporate you know, parks and trails, make it a very livable community, keep our small town feel, um, and make it a very desirable place to live, uh, not just for our current residents, but for future residents as all as as we go forward. So um, I don't know, Liz, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually I do, Mayor, I, that you said that. Um, I remember going to one of the planning commission's uh, meetings a couple of years ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, Dennis is in here tonight. Um, and some of the statements that were made is that we don't have the communication between the uh, uh, planning commission and the city council. So maybe um, a meeting like once a year, some sort of a small retreat between the two groups so that they can kind of get that vision together wouldn't be such a bad idea. Okay, good thought. We did meet with them when we were, when the plan was being put into place as well as, I think there were at least three public um, hearings and open houses inviting the community to, to review the, the thoughts of the planning commission and provide their insights into what their vision of um, the community they wanted. And, and that was how the design came to play. Um, you know, it's just everything that we do is, is, you know, constantly in flux and constantly changing. So reviewing it, it is part of our role. Um, you know, and just continuing to keep that forward momentum so that as we do grow, it's um, capturing what the residents hope to have long, long connecting the trails and the park systems, as well as driving the revenue base that we um, critically need. So it's kind of a combination of, of factors that go into all of it. Okay, thanks Liz, thanks Tom. Okay, so we covered a lot of area here in a relatively short period of time. Again, this is a very complex uh, subject. Uh, a lot of material was covered. I think we'll need to continue having this conversation in future meetings as well. Um, but I do appreciate your presentation this evening, Jeff. And I would definitely encourage um, individual city council members to reach out to, to Jeff. Um, and if you have any questions or, or thoughts that you might want to share with Jeff, um, we would be always anxious to meet with you. Um, and of course, I'm always available as well. Um, so, and um, I know Liz would be available as well if you ever wanted to reach out to her. So um, yeah, If with that being said, um, if there are no other questions or discussion this evening. Uh, I got one question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Jeff, for your presentation. And I got to ask, any chance we can jump the gun on the in-person meeting next week? That's that's above my pay grade. I think, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. That, that was meant for, for the mayor there, but. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So you were asking me. I, so yeah, everybody's anxious to have in-person meetings. Um, there's no question. And uh, I can hardly wait to have in-person meetings as well. I, I don't know what you mean by jumping the gun. Uh, the mask mandate is still in place. The city right now is going through the process of installing our um, TV uh, monitors and our um, recording. Uh, equipment and being able to accommodate both a virtual meeting and a live meeting simultaneously. Uh, the monitors are up, we have the equipment. So it's really just a matter of getting all those different systems working, Sean. And I know the city's working as hard as we can on, on that project, um, but I don't know if they'll be in place by the next city council meeting. So it's, a, it's again, it's something that we've been working towards. Um, and it's just going to be a 
a matter of getting it done and making sure that it operates so that we don't get jammed up and we do ultimately have our first meeting in person. Okay. Absolutely. And I'm, and I'm just looking forward to getting in person. I just feel like productivity is so much better when you can speak face to face with people and not have to fight back and forth over the communication between talking over people through Zoom. I couldn't agree with you more. Thanks for not happy. Thanks for not making me feel that question. I mean, I can barely plug a computer in and uh, it's <laughs> by some miracle that I pulled off clerking this uh, thing tonight. So, yeah, but no. I still have opportunity to screw it up. Yeah. So yeah, I would encourage the council members to stop in and see the new city hall. It's really quite impressive. It's uh, we're making a lot of great improvements. Um, I take my hat off to city staff. They're not only doing keeping up off all their existing work and uh, keeping everything afloat in the city. They're settling into the new building. There's lots of uh, organization that needs to be done. Um, you all know that we're very, you know, we have minimal staff and uh, yeah, it. I know everybody's going wide open trying to get a lot of things done and um, every day we make good progress uh, but unfortunately things just take time and we're all anxious to get to back to in-person meetings and uh, I know with our new facility and the way we'll be able to accommodate our residents it's going to be a huge improvement from what we've had in the past so we're all excited about that and we're excited about having an open house too I mean I haven't lost sight of that so we'll definitely make that available here as soon as we can as well. Um, but we're anxious tomorrow, uh, our new public works director will be starting with us and we're going through interview processing this week for a, a, um, another wastewater treatment plant operator and um, also for a building official. And so, yep, everybody's pretty much consumed with many, many projects, uh, but none is more important right now than trying to get our um, building ready for in-person meetings. Appreciate the question, John. Any other questions or comments here this evening before we uh, call it an evening? Okay, I wanna thank everyone. Thank our guests that are here this evening with us. I uh, hope it was informative for everyone. And with that, we can go ahead and adjourn. Thanks again, Jeff. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.